Um, all right, so again, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Kathleen Fallon, and I am with New York Seagram, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar and panel along with uh, Pam Rubinoff uh, from Rhode Island Sea Grant, as well as Jess Coonan, also from New York Sea Grant. This, um, we can go ahead and um, move on to the next slide, Jess. Um, this webinar series came together as part of a collaborative effort between New York, Rhode Island, and Woods Hole um, and other Northeast Sea Grants to increase our programming and capacity for community monitoring of our respective shorelines, and then getting clear on how to use that information to inform decision making. As increases in precipitation, storm frequency, and intensity and sea level are accelerating throughout the Northeast, it, we feel it is more important than ever to have systems in place to document these changes. While methods for documenting change are not, uh, are not new, we as practitioners really wanted to focus on how to get the most out of these programs to create quality outreach products that are going to add value for our stakeholders. Our approach has been to convene our Northeast Sea Grant colleagues in a learning network over the past year to share best practices, lessons learned, have discussions and conduct research on the tools and methods of community science and monitoring currently used throughout the US. We are calling ourselves coastal commons for community monitoring of shorelines. Um, as part of this learning network, we are pleased to present our second webinar in a series of four that will take place over the next year. Today we'll be focusing on beach monitoring and last month we focused on coastal flooding. If you are unable to join us for the previous webinar, you can access a recording and we can put the link in the chat. Um, the next webinars will take place in the spring and summer of 2022, and we'll keep you guys posted um, on that as we know more about it. Um, just can, next slide, please. So today we're going to be hearing from three guests the four guest speakers to hear about their beach monitoring community science programs, including beach profiling, sand grain uh, sediment analysis, and uh, shoreline change, and how they are using data in decision making. We have kind of a hybrid format where each presenter will talk for 10 minutes about their specific project, and then we'll have a panel discussion in the final 15 to 20 ish minutes. We ask that you please submit questions throughout the webinars to our panelists by typing them into the Q&A box. Uh, you can open this by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webinar window. We may have time to take one or two questions after each presentation, but we encourage questions for the panel as a whole. We will address questions depending on relevance to the conversation and the panel and if we have time. The chat feature is also enabled for you to comment and interact with each other during the presentation. Please be sure to select who you'd like to send your chat to. You can send it to the panelists or panelists and attendees. If you type a question in the chat, we'll remind you to please enter it into the Q&A box. Today's webinar is being recorded and we will make it available on the uh, HUI webpage, similar as the previous uh, webinar. Um, eventually, we plan on having an entire web page dedicated to this project on Hui Sea Grants uh, site. Um, we look forward to having a really great discussion today. And now we are going to move on to our first presentation, which we will be hearing from Kristen Grant from Maine Sea Grant and John Cannon from the National Weather Service. Thanks, Kathleen. Really looking forward to working with everybody today. Thanks so much for your interest. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen here. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna take everybody on a quick tour of the Southern Maine Beach Profile Monitoring Program, and I've already been introduced. 
And for those of you that don't know, you might be asking yourself what exactly is beach profiling. So it's a um, simple surveying technique that's used to measure the contour of a beach. And in our case, the um, program was started in 1999 as a Sea Grant funded research project, actually. And um, the the original um, researchers on the project were geologists from the University of Maine and Maine Geological Survey. And um, the project is supported by the partners you see here, the Wells Reserve, Maine Geological Survey, Maine Coastal Program, um, my organization, um, and really importantly, the participating cities and towns where the beaches are located. But the program is really only possible due to the uh, roughly 120 volunteers that we have working um, in teams on our uh, southern Maine beaches. And um, I was really happy to see that um, some of those volunteers are actually joining us on the webinar today. So uh, welcome to our uh, beach profilers from Maine. Really glad to have you here. And so we have um, teams working on 14 beaches in Southern Maine. And the, um, the volunteer teams go out to profile one time a month, 12 months of the year for now coming up on 23 years. So are we have this incredible data set at this point. And the goal of the program is to develop a record of change on our beaches to provide an understanding of coastal processes to inform beach management, which is obviously what we're here to talk about today. So, um, what I'm going to be spending most of my time on and then, you know, John Cannon after me is what those beach management decisions are. So I'm going to give you um, a few examples here. All right, so the first stop is to talk about the State of Maine's Beaches Report, which is produced by our in the Maine partner, um, Maine Geological Survey. And so Maine Geological Survey um, is the recipient of the data, and they analyze the data for looking at lo both long-term and seasonal trends in the data, and how the beaches recover from, um, from the impacts of large storms. And the um, report has been um, released released um, biennially every year since 2007. And then you might be wondering who it is that actually uses the data. In, in our case, it's the main Department of Environmental Protection, the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the local municipalities, and as you'll get to hear much more in a minute here, the National Weather Service. All right, and I also wanted to take you on a tour of a few specific examples of how the data has been used. But before I do that, I'll give you sort of a laundry list of um, the major categories of the ways that the, the data gets used. So I'll just read you from my list here. So the data has been used and continues to be used for tracking long-term trends in erosion rates and associated flood risks, designing dune restoration projects, evaluating beach nourishment options and effectiveness, guiding management planning for harbor dredging, monitoring management of endangered species such as um, piping plovers and least terns, estimating the capacity for beach recreational use and um, investigating new erosion mitigation um, technologies such as here in Long Sands Beach in York, the um, development of, a, um, of an innovative um, seawall which was um, the largest seawall reconstruction and redesign project in the state. And it uses a tiered design that helps to, um, to break up the wave energy so that it does less, in, in less damaging impact on the beach and the road immediately behind the beach and the buildings immediately behind the road, not to mention the infrastructure um, in the road itself. Another example is um, from Camp Ellis in, um, in Saco, where um, the beach profiling data has been used to track the, um, the erosion that's occurred after beach nourishment was placed at Camp Ellis um, in order to, to determine that the, the nourished, the sand that was used to, to nourish the beach has been in fact um, migrating north. And so the use of the data is helping us to understand just exactly what the longevity of um, nourish, beach nourishment to our beaches is. And the last example, uh, Gooch's Beach in, um, in Kennebunk, Maine, 
And in this case, um, the Army Corps of Engineers is using beach profiling data to, as a reference for an environmental assessment that's been used, um, being done to, um, to explore um, repairs to the jetties at the mouth of the um, Kennebunk River. So, and um, these examples are, again, thanks only to the fact that we have our um, really dedicated teams that are um, profiling at each of these beaches and about um, 12 other beaches in addition to these. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John Cannon now so that he can talk to you about a specific example that, of how the National Weather Service uses the data. And I will stop my presentation here and turn it over to John. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that very nice overview. Uh, let's see here, let's share on my screen. And you should be able to see it right now. Perfect, John. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you for that overview, uh, Kristen. Now we're gonna give an example of how we use in the National Weather Service, community science for warning decision-making. So you're thinking, how can that happen? Well, I'll show you the process of that, how that happens in a second. I just wanted to show you that picture is from Camp Ellis, which Kristen just showed from a couple of years ago. That brown wave indicates a lot of sand inside that wave. That uh, dune you're looking at uh, was uh, completely eroded from the storm. Uh, so this is important things we're looking at. So in the next few minutes, I'll quickly go through this. Um, so at the National Weather Service, we do forecasts of erosion and splashover. So we're forecasting in very short time uh, I just wanted to tell you, we're forecasting whether or not waves are going to strike the dunes, whether we're going to have erosion. And where your uh, beach pro profiles come in, when we have a profile before and after storm, we can see how much sand was lost from any given particular storm. So the uh, profiles allow us to, uh, to assess our beach armor along the beaches, see how we're doing with time. This is from Rye Beach a couple years ago. So um, again, your breach profiles uh, can be used to assess the need for future warnings. Let me give you an example of this. Everybody knows the blizzard of 78. Well, the people have been around for a while, I should say, and the people from Maine, very famous blizzard. But there was a storm before that in January that which wiped out the dunes, wiped out the boulders along the coast. So when that February blizzard of eight storm came, there was no armor left. So Knowing the state of the beaches and the dune pro profiles that are sent to us by the volunteers allows us the weather service for situational awareness that can be included in our discussions and warnings. Here's an example of one of those uh, warnings and discussions. These are issued daily to the public. Um, we had a storm and we put right in the statement that the beach profiles indicated significant erosion over recent months. Therefore, we may be more vulnerable to erosion and splash over at this time. So when we know there's gonna be a problems along our coast due to previous storm surveys and forecast models, uh, we can issue early warnings. That leads to mitigation efforts. That leads to the Department of Public Works, uh, CERT, Citizen Emergency Response Team activations, reverse 9-1 code reds out there. So your, your play in this is, is, is part of the whole process of the warning process. So the flood mitigation and all that is, starts with the, with the partially with the dune survey, surveys. We also do storm-based dune surveys. So I just happen to have a copy of when you're gonna be issuing, uh, doing your, your, your beach profiling. In fact, December 2nd through 6th, there's a period coming up. And in rare occurrences, I will ask, ask for an, an additional storm survey to be done immediately after a storm or immediately before the storm. And what that does is it allows you to take a snapshot of what happened, what type of erosion was due to that storm. Sometimes you have to take a snapshot like that because the beach will naturally replenish itself over time or it can over time. So it's nice to have uh, two profiles within uh, a storm. So I wanted to give an example of how this all works. Uh, we talk about nor'easters all the time. Nor'easters, nor'easters, they're, they're famous up in New England and all that. But occasionally we do have a southeaster and southeasters are due to very warm waters over the Gulf of Maine. It allows for mixing and strong winds to reach the coast as opposed to an ordinary nor'easter. Uh, and we've had plenty of warm water winters the last few years, uh, record warm as a matter of fact. So 
uh, the January Southeaster shifted impact locations. We're used to having impacts on certain portions along the coast. For example, we always hear about Camp Ellis and Ferry Beach. Uh, Kristen mentioned it, I already mentioned it. There's Ferry Beach with the X in the upper left-hand corner. And if you have a strong southeasterly wind, you're blocked by the islands. So that when you do a dune, dune pro profile immediately before and after the storm, uh, there wasn't much, not much change at all. So the normal places that do get slammed really hard were protected. So it was a change in where the locations were. Gooch's Beach is unfortunately uh, uh, a flip side of the coin where you are exposed in portions of the beach to a southeast wind. And if you look at the dune profile for this particular southeaster, there were extraordinary changes from one prof profile to the next. Um, looking at lots of uh, erosion along the coast. Hampton Beach, I wanted to show you an example, uh, example of the southeaster in New Hampshire. They report the erosion a little differently, just one interesting to show. Uh, this particular southeaster had uh, about two meters of, uh, of uh, sand loss along the entire uh, uh, line along the top of the beach. So that was very significant. In Genesis Beach, here's an ex another example of the New Hampshire's methodology, how they show their data. This is over a longer period of time. This is not for that southeaster, but you can see the cold season in blue lines and the warm season in red lines. So in the cold season, you're getting this loss in sand, which you would expect with wintertime storms. And the warm season, you're getting that natural increase in sand along the beaches from time. And that happens from season to season and season to season. So just to sum this up, I just wanted to add this. There's a little social point, uh, social science portion of this as well. Um, when we warn for hurricanes, northeasters, southeasters, people have cognitive thoughts, social thoughts, and effective thoughts about how the storm is gonna impact them. Are they risk aversive or risk seeking? And just to finish up here, um, it, that really makes a difference. It makes a difference from what you do as a doom profiler, so what I do as a, as a senior forecaster issuing warnings, uh, we need to know, uh, make sure that people believe the danger is real, uh, that they know there, there, is a, there, is a, there is a chance uh, for a dangerous situation, how to respond, and do they have the resources to expand, uh, respond? So do the, is the level of risk unacceptable or acceptable to them? So on that note, uh, I know that was very quick to go through. We went through a lot of science in, in five minutes. Uh, I hope I didn't go too long or whatever, but um, thank you for having me today. Thanks so much, uh, Kristen and John. Um, this is great. We've got a lot of great key, uh, questions coming in the Q&A, but uh, just to stay on time, I'm gonna go straight to uh, Shelley Whitmire from James Madison University. Kristen and John might be able to answer some of the questions directly in the Q&A box. Um, otherwise, we will revisit them at the uh, during our panel. Uh, Shelley, go ahead and take it away. Okay, well, thank you. Um, let's see, just get all my screens straight again here. Um, I work at James Madison University, and I am going to be sharing with you guys a project that I've been working on for oh, a few years now. I guess in uh, 2018, we st first started this idea um, about developing a coastal sediment database. Um, in what we were able to do here that we hadn't been able to do before is use some of the technology that was sort of coming of age. And basically that is your smartphone and um, some algorithms written by people um, that are really smart. I didn't write them, but they, they did a great job. So let's see, um, first of all, like any good project, right? There's a lot of support behind this. Um, and I am just one person on a team here. And the other people that I'd like to recognize by name, um, I'm working with Brian McFall and David Young from the Army Corps of Engineers. They have certainly been um, our leaders behind this, really getting this going, finding the funding to put all these different parts together. Um, Daniel Bascom, he is the one that has written this algorithm that will actually look at an image and give you out the grain size properties. And then we're also pairing up with the um, USGS and we have Jonathan Warwick who's been helping us there. 
But this is very much a community driven project and without all these other people, there would be nothing there. Um, so we do have people around the United States, um, even some international that have been collecting some of these samples. And so of course we appreciate them uh, because this is very much a community effort. So why SANSNAP? Um, basically, I, I think you, this audience probably already knows this, but um, effective management really relies on our ability to identify areas that are at risk. Um, and to do that, we really need good data. And so some types of data that we use, especially at a large scale, kind of a general scale, is fairly available. Um, for example, we might use elevation data. Um, we might have larger data of different study areas. We could use satellite images. If we're thinking about waves, we might be able to get data from wave buoys or something like that. Um, but sediment is really difficult to get. Um, this is an important parameter when you think about modeling things. Sediment transport is um, highly influenced by the sediment size that you use. But traditionally, gathering sediment means that somebody needs to go to a beach. So, you, of course, you have travel time. They have to collect a physical sample and they have to bring it back to a lab and sieve it. And I'm sure any of you that have sieved sediment. Um, can understand the tediousness of this. On top of that, um, these are not static conditions, so they're constantly going to be changing. So it requires multiple trips um, to the beach and multiple analyses to really get a good understanding of what's going on. So we're really looking for a way to fill in this gap with data. Okay. We also need the sediment data for those preliminary studies, large scale um, depth of closure studies might be another application, um, looking at gradations over time and um, renourishment. So life cycle of renourishment and looking for beach compatibility. So how does this work? Um, so we are using phones, right? So we'll have somebody go out to the um, beach and take an image. Um, the image has to have a coin in it because we need to scale it. We use a online survey called Survey123 and it's part of the Esri suite and we use this form because it lets us take location from the phone at the same time as somebody would upload an image there too. It's uploaded to a server um, and then it's analyzed so the image would be analyzed with the algorithm which is called SETINET. And then those, um, the data or the results are pushed back out onto a website. They're gonna be available to the user that actually collected the sample probably within minutes, um, but will also be added to our public database. So this is an example of um, collecting a sample. Uh, you can see me at the beach with my phone taking a picture. Notice how close um, my phone is to the sand. Also notice right in the corner here, that is the coin that I'm using for scale in this image. On the right hand side of the screen, you're going to see there is the um, form that we use to upload the data. Um, you know, the, you can call this website up on a desktop, but it's not going to do you much good because we do have um, the GPS data. So, you know, if you call this up on your phone, you can just tap that and it will take your location. We also have asked the users to fill out a little bit of a form just to get some background data because just a quality check sort of. So make sure your latitude and longitude are reasonable. You might fill out something like beach name and just say like Jones Beach. And then, you know, if we find out Jones Beach and your latitude longitudes in Africa, we know something's wrong with that sample. So it helps us quality check. We also ask um, some specific details about like where on the beach you are, whether it's the berm or the dune. And we ask that because I think the GPS on your phone is not that accurate. So it kind of gets the right beach, but it might not know where you are on the beach. Uh, we also have information about samples. So some people will be collecting data, like a physical sample at the same time they take the image and we use that to actually train the model. So uh, we have a place to put in that information also. 
So this is the database that we have currently. Um, we have about 30, or sorry, 300 samples. And you can see they're mostly within the United States with a couple international samples we have there. So SAMSNAP still um, in a beta version, although it is available to the public. So when I give you the website at the end, if you're interested in trying to collect a sample, we would love you to try to do that. Um, but we are still troubleshooting a few things. Um, we are continuing on the technical side. Um, we keep trying to improve that setting net model. Um, so we have a team constantly working on that, trying to get us better results. And the big thing we've done over the summer and into this fall, which is now available, is we've moved this process um, from a manual process where we had to download all the images and run them through the SETI net model to a cloud-based version. And so now that it is a cloud-based version, uh, we're really excited because this means when somebody does upload an image within minutes, they're going to get results rather than waiting for us to run it, which could be weeks to months when we, when we did it. So that's a big improvement that just came out this fall. Um, we're also trying to keep the public involved because again, this is a cloud-based um, project. And so if we don't have people collecting, uh, it's, it's not gonna be a very good tool. So we have um, tried to do public outreach um, and in first, our, our first attempt with, with Kathleen and Sea Grant, and we started planning this in March of 2020. So I guess, you guys all know what happened at that point, we canceled the event. Um, and we did realize that at least for a while by that summer, we realized hosting in-person events was not gonna be the thing for us. So we went to a more um, socially distanced model and we created kits that could be shared through the library systems. Um, and so you can see an example of one of our kits here. It's that large black anchor bag and it was filled with materials and instructions for several kind of STEM based activities that um, kids could do at the beach. And one of those activities, of course, was looking at um, the sand and getting us one of those sand snap samples. Um, luckily, things are sort of going back more to normal. So finally, this June, we were able to host our in-person event, and we did that at Jones Beach. So we had Girl Scouts come, and we tried to gather activities that would help them fulfill their requirements for one of their journeys, which is a citizen science journey. So um, our project kind of fit really well with that. And I would like to give you a quick demo of our website um, because this is live. So, you know, you could go online and you can see it, but this is our website here. Um, you know, you, there's a background, you know, like a lot of stuff I've shared with you already, but you can also get the form here. So, you know, like I said, on a desktop, this really is not useful, but you, if you pulled it up on your phone, you could do that. And we also have our data viewer here too, which um, I think is more useful. So this is an interactive map and you can zoom in on these different areas. Um, the little sand snap logo, those are the samples. And if you click on them, um, you can see here are the results that we're getting. Um, you know, we have the D50, D65, um, we have a lot of them because we kind of figured once the computer was calculating, we can make the computer calculate pretty quickly. Um, but you also get the image there, so you can see that too. Um, if you were submitting images, um, you can check on your analysis and, and get those results right away. It would be shown in their recent submissions here too. And then the last thing I want to share with you is just our future plans here. So um, unlike Kristen and John, our project is really kind of in its infancy here. And so we're really, I'm happy to be here because we want to share this tool and the hope that more people are going to be using it. So we will continue to try to promote it. Um, as this database gets filled up, we see a lot of opportunities to share this data. And so we are looking into K-12 education and how we can get this out to the teachers in a meaningful way with lessons that address the standards they need to address. And of course, we'll continue to share this um, on our website so anybody could download the data and work on it there. 
And so the last thing I want to share with you here um, is contact information for myself and also for Brian. Uh, we are very eager for you to use this tool, so please give it a try. And if you have any trouble or any suggestions, um, just shoot us an email and we would be happy to work with you. We'd like that feedback. And the QR code here, if you do want to scan it with your phone, it should take you to our SandSnap website. Great. Right. Thank you so much, Shelly. That was uh, super. Um, again, just moving along with timing, uh, we're going to go straight into Ian uh, from the Army Corps. Um, and again, Shelly, uh, you might be able to answer some questions in the Q&A, um, and we can always revisit them at the end during our panel session. Ian, take it away when you're ready. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're perfect. Well, thanks so much for, for having me. Um, I'm Ian Connery, I'm uh, located at, um, it's, it's an Army Corps uh, research pier known as the, the Field Research Facility or the FRF maybe is more familiar to some of you. Um, we're sort of, we're part of a broader uh, lab structure, uh, specifically, um, ERDIC, which is the Engineer Research and Development Center, which is um, located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But uh, again, I'm in the, the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And so I'm excited to share uh, some of the uh, recent work on uh, this COSNAP project. And USA-SE just stands for Southeast. So this is sort of our Southeast um, network. Um, and um, it's important to acknowledge this, this technology was first created uh, at the University of New South Wales uh, in Sydney um, by a group that we, we work pretty closely with um, on a, a variety of um, uh, coastal imaging projects. And so uh, just to give you um, an idea of <clears throat> CoSnap, um, I don't have time really to go into the sort of the the nuts and, and bolts of, of all the methodology, but um, essentially it's, it's a, a citizen science project that hinges on using cell phone imagery. So, you know, cell phones now are, you know, basically ubiquitous. Everyone uh, pretty much has a cell phone in their, their pocket or purse or in the resolution of the cameras have progressed uh, so dramatically that they, you know, they, they have become this sort of powerful tool. Um, and again, this was this was started in 2017, I believe, in Australia, um, and from there to sort of pilot stations. It's been amazing uh, to watch this this grow internationally. It's it's uh, in 16 countries, over 130 stations now, and so some of these photos just highlight the neat sort of um, geologic uh, variety that. The, the project is capturing so we can look across the world at you know these different settings um, and track our shorelines. Um, I'll say that uh, what seems like simple technology is very complex. There's a lot of math and physics that goes into these photogrammetric um, calculations. And so it's been years or really decades of, of algorithm development um, with our group, but also folks at Oregon State University um, and CERN, which is a coastal imaging research network. Um, so a lot of great work has been done to get us to this, this point where we can actually use a, a cell phone image for something um, uh, useful quantitatively. Um, so we were the first location in the US, um, which was in Nags Head, um, North Carolina. Um, and so I'll, I'll focus in on our, our first station. Um, at, we, we have one at our research pier, but then our first public station was at um, Jeanette's Pier in Nags Head. And um, Nags Head is, yeah, sort of uh, central Outer Banks. Um, you can see the location here on the, the bottom left panel. Um, and this is just showing the, the spot on the pier. Um, on the East Coast, we don't have the luxury of having, you know, elevation and a great vantage point. So we're, we're sort of restricted to piers, uh, you know, in Australia, they, they were lucky to have some of these hikes or, you know, mountain bluffs that would look over vast stretches and to capture, you know, extensive shoreline. We don't have as many options. So we were lucky um, to partner with 
um, Jeanette's Pier, which is part of the state aquariums. Um, and they, they've been great hosts um, for us. Um, and so again, the, it's, a, it's a pretty simple setup. You can see from that bottom middle panel, it, all it involves is some signage um, and this, this uh, metal uh, stainless uh, camera cradle where you set your phone on. Um, and this camera cradle, what's important is it's in a fixed position. So that angle from every image is the exact same. And so we, we, can, um, we can actually use these programs then to, to extract some, some information because everyone's photo is in that, that same position. Um, our fabrications team at the, the pier is great and they, they build us these little mounts um, that we can you know, adjust to depending on where your area is. And so the, the bottom right, Images just showing an example from that Jeanette's Pier um, station. Uh, so then, sort of behind the scenes is uh, I'm showing this this screenshot from uh, uh, MATLAB and in in panel C there in the top right. Uh, behind the scenes is where the all the complex um, calculations happen. Um, and right now it's in a, a GUI or graphical user user interface, um, but essentially you um, are loading your image um, and you click a few ground control points, which I'll get to in a second. Um, then the algorithm um, automatically picks out the wet and dry boundary based on pixel properties. And from that, uh, then you, you're going from a uh, sideways looking image or oblique image from your cell phone. We're gonna convert that to a, a map, uh, map space so we can actually pull numbers um, from it. And so you can see that map uh, that's generated on the, the, the right, um, the top right panel. And so then we can use the map product to compare um, different shorelines in time, um, depending on what we might be interested in. So without going too much into the methodology, uh, I think one of the most critical aspects is having these, these ground control points. And that again, allows us to go from a sideways looking image um, into a, a map, into map space. And so we go out with a, an RTK GPS or a LIDAR system to collect um, these different fixed points in the field of view. And those are just shown by the, the arrows. We, we climbed up gazebos and um, hotel rooftops for elevator shafts, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we also made this composite image you can see on the right uh, by wading around in the water uh, with a target. And so we added some additional control um, since our frame is dominated by water. And so all these points then have a, an exact, very a precise location um, that we can use to rectify or essentially tie it into a, into a uh, again, map space. And so uh, we, we started uh, again with our, our first station at the, the field research facility in the, the top right there um, and then late 2019, we, we installed our first uh, public station at Jeanette's. Um, and now we've grown, we've added a few more this year. Um, uh, another regional station at Avalon Pier. Um, we've teamed up with some folks, uh, Joe Long and his group at UNCW, they, they installed a station at Curry Beach. Um, and then we have this newer station as well um, at Willoughby Spit uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. And so we, it's been fun to, um, sort of partner and, and help this, this grow. Um, we have a, a few more lined up that should happen uh, hopefully soon. Um, and in terms of you know, helping decision-making, um, I should emphasize that coastal monitoring um, is very um, expensive um, and it requires a lot of personnel. It's really cool to see the main work. Um, but you know, a lot of our methods um, require again it, it, a lot of a lot of money. So we essentially we we result in sparse data, both in space and time. And with sparse data, it's hard to um, plan be your beach projects or modify your beach projects. And so the idea with CoSnap is to add some sort of supplemental monitoring data um, using you know citizens. So it's it's free data and it it takes minimal processing. So it's it's really sort of powerful, um, it has powerful potential for, for helping, you know, coastal managers and planners um, capturing a variety of different 
uh, management actions. I've highlighted some of those at the, the Virginia Beach Pier. They have, you know, sand bypassing happening and um, inlet dredging and uh, federal nourishment cycles. So it's really important to understand how these, these systems are changing from storms and just with, you know, seasonal dynamics. Um, similar to Shelly and her group, we, we've adopted this um, ArcGIS cloud to sort of field our our data and the uh, our original signage um, required uh, users to submit via email or uh, social media and what we found is people's attention spans are very short and they're not uh, you know often willing to read instructions and so we were getting a fair amount of submissions but not as many as we sort of knew we could get and so we we switched over to this qr code um, which is that that bottom panel and since adding the qr code our submissions have gone up dramatically um, over the summer there were many days where we had over you know 15 submissions um, at at Jeanette's pier and i'm showing some of these other numbers um, at some of our other stations um, but just since uh may we've we've had a thousand submissions at Jeanette's pier so it sort of shows you know the the, the human dynamic of it you have to have something that's appealing and and easy to use. Um, some of the, the products from this, uh, from CoSnap um, are shown here on the left panel. This is a, a, the recent nor'easter uh, that impacted our area. So you can have a quick assessment of your, your sort of beach state and impacts and your recovery. Um, and again, you're getting you know, information at each sort of pixel. Um, you can also look if, if you focus on the right panel um, we can look at seasonal changes again or you know longer term changes um, and this is just the colors are reflecting time so the blues start in june and then the reds are representing uh, november and so this should this is showing at our spot we have some gradual sort of longer term or, or seasonal erosion um, so this is again hopefully you know beneficial to to managers and planners um, i won't spend too much time here, but the we, we wanted to before we sort of grow and uh, you know advertise this for for others to use. We wanted to see how accurate it was, and so we went out and walked the shoreline ourselves with a RTK system, um, and that's what I'm showing here on the, the top left panel. You can see that the Coast Snap generated shorelines align really well um, with the the walked shorelines, and then we were testing, you know how does your title record affect it because these need to be title tidally corrected depending on when your image was taken how does uh, the input of waves affect it and so essentially if you have good wave and tide data your your results will be be more uh, be more accurate the top right is just showing um so from june uh 2020 to um, october of this year um the changes in the shoreline behavior the the red is the sort of monthly average from CoSnap. And then the, the blue is comparing with our really high fidelity expensive LIDAR system. And the takeaway here is the CoSnap uh, produces the same trends um, as, our, as our LIDAR system does, um, which was pretty encouraging, you know, as we hope to expand. You can also see how the submissions have gone up dramatically since June before we had sort of infrequent um, data. So again, the, the shoreline is the focus here, but we can learn so much more from images. They're, you know, incredibly powerful. Um, we can look at the timing and um, development of scarps, which affect, you know, beach trafficability and sort of beach hazards. We can look at, you know, grain size uh, or sedimentology. Maybe we have these darker, heavy mineral layers. We can look at different shapes. We can look at, um, you know, how high the water reached during a storm. We can look at um, vegetation coverage, a, a whole host of things um, beyond just shorelines we can um, look at qualitatively. So lastly, we, we've uh, had a lot of fun doing some outreach um, with some summer camps. And then we're, you know, we've started to team up with different teachers to try to grow our stations. Um, and uh, with that, I think I'll, I'll wrap up here. Just a couple of quick time lapses made in Adobe. Uh, the left is from Willoughby Spit and the right is from Jeanette's Pier. Um, and you can see, especially in the right 
uh, panel how the how dramatically the beach changes just over the course of of a year. Um, here is my email, so feel free to reach out if we uh, don't have time for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, I think we are going to jump straight into the panel discussion now. Um, so, um, Ian, Pretty maybe if you I... could, Ian, yep. if you could maybe uh, stop sharing your screen so we can see everybody's faces. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Pam is going to take it away when she's ready. Super. Um, <clears throat> Ian, uh, you, you gave a great talk and there were a couple of questions. So we'll let you answer some of those uh, specific questions. But while you're doing this to see if there's any other ones after, first of all, thank you all and uh, great panelists and appreciate all of these questions and that the panelists have answered most of them. So, um, but we do have some time, actually, Rebecca Short asked this at the very beginning um, for the whole panel. Um, have you run into challenges when recruiting participants of communicating the so what? We found other climate change risks such as urban heat island effect to have a greater sense of urgency and interest for the target communities. So um, I'm just wondering if uh, Kristen or Ian, Shelley, John, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, I can take a stab at that. The, what I've found in my years of working with volunteers is that the some of them are very interested in the so what and others are not. So um, I try to be aware of the range of reasons that people might be interested in um, participating in the program because, you know, for example, in a, the um, as a benefit of participating in um, in beach profile monitoring, we offer free um, registration to the um, the semi the um, biennial beaches conference, but. As much as we, you know, try to use that as a way to recognize our volunteers, there are people that are really not all that concerned about how the data is used. They're, you know, really interested in walking on the beach or, you know, sharing time with friends, and so, uh, so that's a, a thing I try to keep in mind. But for those that are really um, concerned with the so what, I've have tried to make sure that we're communicating how the data is used. And in particular, because we have um, you know, critical support from Maine Geological Survey is the sort of you know, first data um, analyst of our, um, of our program that folks have, have access to that report. And then, you know, as I mentioned, the, um, the sharing of that data is done is at this, um, con this conference that we hold every couple of years. Um, so we um, make it possible for the volunteers to attend for um, registration free. Great, that's a great incentive to get them uh, going there. Um, others, or, or I do have a follow-up question for- I just for... wanna piggyback on what Kristen said really quickly. Um, yeah. I think that's why she invites me to some of the conferences so I can give people near real time examples. What, ma what made a difference? How did this change over the last season? Why did you issue this type of warning? Why did you do this? And if I can put the pieces together, I, I think that helps a little bit with, with uh, people's uh, incentives. Right. So as a, as, a, um, as a follow up to that question, so um, in order for the community to benefit, you know, you've just talked about how this data is being used to some extent in preparation and, and data reports and such. But how do you really give it back to the communities and to the um, to the volunteers? Some of those reports are a little hard to get through. I, I haven't read those in particular, but others. Um, so I'm just really trying to understand how does the community benefit and how, how do you facilitate that through other kinds of um, data or, or synthesis? 
Pam, is that directed at John and me or is it? Well, oh, no, I think it's a, in general, you know, each one of you had some great information. Um, and a lot of that is good for conferences and, and people uh, like ourselves, but, you know, for a municipal planner, for a volunteer in the neighborhood, what, um, what benefit does it give to them and how, how can they receive it best? Well, there's a webinar coming to you for hopefully for our, um, Volunteers in the near future, where Maxwell and uh, Kristen are working on it now, and and after this meeting, we'll be setting up a date in December to do a follow up for the volunteers who are interested, or any anybody for that matter. Super. Yeah. So just to just to sort of elaborate on that, there for our volunteers, um, the, we with our current volunteer coordinator, there's been a um, an effort to put together what, what we're calling learning sessions. And it's sort of um, coincident with COVID and you know moving life online so that, that um, it, it gives us a chance to get together virtually with folks. Um, so those, I, mean, I don't know, they have happened with three or four times now over the course of the last year. Great. Thank you. Um, there's just a, another question here about quality assurance. Um, so there was a question from Rebecca, do volunteers have to get certified and are all the data uh, entries reviews, reviewed by a staff person before um, it's officially submitted or used? So I know that John said that he reviews things a couple of times a year, but just in terms of most of the data. Yeah, by the time I see the data, the, uh, the coordinator in, in our case for Maine has reviewed the data and gone through the data. So by the time I access it, it has been reviewed. And he, he does do training. Kristen could probably answer to whether or not there's an actual certification process. I don't think so, but there is a, a training aspect to it, both online and in person, or it used to be on, in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to suck up all the, you know, the airtime with, you know, a focus on beach profiling here, but so no, there's nothing as formal as a, as a certification, but there is a, um, a after recruitment, a training process with the, um, with the volunteer coordinator, and then the support, you know, that happens with the team members as that, you know, person joins the team. And then part of the, uh, our QA, QC protocol involves the volunteer coordinator visiting the team in the field to help, you know, just sort of ensure that the methods being used in the field, you know, in accordance with the Emory method, which is the method that, that we use. Um, and John already for, referred to the QA's QC that's done as a, you know, as a first glance at the data. So the data is entered into our online data system. And then a series of data is looked at um, in coordination with the newest entered data in order to identify any outliers. If there are outliers, the volunteer coordinator follows up with the team and tries to correct the, um, the error if there is one. Thank you. But let's, I'll make space for other programs to answer. How about uh, Shelly yeah. or, or Ian? I, Pam, I was going to say, um, I think it's really interesting to hear about all these other projects because I do think um, there is a big difference between what Kristen and John are doing with beach profiling. And Ian, I'm going to throw you into my category and you just tell me if you don't want to be there or not. But I, about the amount of training that our volunteers need, um, you know, to collect a beach profile, that's pretty significant. I mean, you do need training to do that. And, you know, I know I've done it myself, depending on how big you are, I think your survey is you're looking at what, 20 minutes plus travel time, you know, to get there. Whereas what we're doing with sand snap is really like snap a picture. Like once you know how to do it, I mean, we're looking for seconds of somebody's time. Um, so the training is really low. And I guess our, there, there's two things that may, that I think about is our way of looking for participants is very different because we don't require the training. And it also is different in how we quality control too. We're pretty much going with the, cloud sourcing message that if we get enough data, we're going to be able to weed out the bad data from people that are completely untrained. And um, a lot of this has to do with the algorithms that we're running and that there are quality control checks in it. Um, and again, this is not my specialty with the coding, but 
they do little things like look at how elliptical is your coin versus circular and then they know if your camera was crooked and they look for how blurry that image is and things like that so um, there are some quality controls um, that are very automated and we're also look hoping that we can get enough data that the bad data kind of like gets um covered up with the good data maybe that's the way it is so so we're going for like a mass data collection um but it's also a different way of motivating people too because um you know we're not looking for people that are really looking to put a couple hours into doing this we're looking for people who happen to walk by one of our signs and we'll just take a couple minutes to do it um and that's it can have some positive effects in that our cost to get our volunteers started is very low, but there's also the bad side of that is there's not much payback for them, right? They took a picture and they uploaded it. Like getting somebody to care about what your grain size is, I've actually found it's very challenging. I mean, uh, I think it's great. I mean, I love sand. I, I made a career over sand, right? But not everybody shares that interest with me. So um, trying to share that with the general public and seeing why this really is important and we need their help can be a challenge. Great insight. Um, clearly the differences between the, the different kinds of program, the different kind of training and uh, the, the different purposes. But um, you're, you're absolutely correct that each, each program really needs to adapt um, their, you know, in terms of their QA, QC, what does that really mean um, for each one? And that's gonna be very different for, for each program. Ian, did you have anything to add? Um, yeah, our, you know, ours is simple. We, we, we don't need training as long as you know how to take a, a photo from your cell phone and, and uh, we'll scan a QR code. Um, we have, you know, so there's a manual component still uh, in, in matching these images. We have to click four points um, in our program. So by the time you download it, you have maybe a minute per image. But we're hoping as we expand to automate everything um, just so we don't have to, you know, individually manage it. Um, and so that way, you know, the, all, everything would be done uh, behind the scenes. And that, so that's sort of the focus of our next work unit um, is, is how to, which will make it, you know, more approachable to expand. Um. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of the participants um, answering some great questions. We got most of them. Um, we'll take a couple minutes for our, our part, our panelists to see if they could add one more answer to it, but I'm going to turn it back to Kathleen. Thanks, Pam. Um, yes, we'll leave the webinar open, but I know just based on time, most people might need to be jumping off for their next meeting. So thank you all for attending. Uh, just put an evaluation link in the chat. If you guys uh, could take a few minutes to fill that out, that would be great. Um, and we will be following up, uh, sending out a follow-up email that will include the recording link, um, the awesome links that the of these different projects um, and panelists contact information and all of that so uh, feel free to continue the conversation beyond this webinar it was um, really really great so thank you Kristen and John and Shelly and Ian for attending and sharing all of this uh, great information with us we really appreciate it